group of producers in that we uh, know that have put some of these to test and uh, have done some different experimenting on their own operations to uh, share some things that have worked for them, maybe some things that have not worked for them. Uh, so uh, we asked them if they'd be willing to come in and uh, share some information with you guys. Uh, so we're going to have them come up, introduce themselves, tell, give a couple minute background information on their farm uh, operation, how they uh, utilize uh, the byproducts on their farm, and then uh, we're going to turn the floor over to you guys to ask them questions. So our producer panel, uh, Darren Slagvold, uh, producer down in my county in Ransom County uh, in McLeod, uh, North Dakota, uh, runs a, a purebred uh, operation with a feedlot operation. Uh, been experimenting with different types of byproducts uh, mixed in with uh, some different uh, feed stuff. So uh, he's going to serve as one of the producer panel. Uh, Kevin Elliott uh, from up by uh, Clifford. Uh, his family also runs a purebred Simitel operation, a feedlot operation. Uh, it was out to his operation here a couple of years ago. Uh, they do quite a bit of different work with some uh, byproducts. And uh, won't hold it against them. We we're college classmates together. Uh, Justin Spickler, uh, let's see, up by Glenfield, runs a registered Angus operation with his brother. Uh, and they do, again, uh, quite a bit of different use with some byproducts. Uh, Keith Gimmel, probably the one I don't know uh, or least know uh, on this panel. So uh, I guess. I don't know your whole background, but you can do that when you come up and introduce yourself and uh, talk about uh, what your operation is. So if we get the producer panel up here, uh, we'll get going with that. So I guess we're going to turn the mic over. We'll start over here with Darren. And again, if, he, uh, if you guys want to uh, introduce yourself, give a little bit of background about your operation, how you uh, got going with the byproducts, how you use them, uh, maybe a couple uh, instances, uh, how they're working for you, maybe something that hasn't worked for you, and then pass it down the line, and then we'll open up for discussion. Like Brian said, my name is Darren Sagbold, um, down in the McLeod area. We run a cow-calf operation, registered limousine cattle, and a feedlot. Um, we use a lot, a lot of beef pulp the last couple winters, especially um, with our water situation down there. <coughs> We've been really short on feed, and uh, feed pulp is, has really saved our butt. Uh, we also use a lot of distillers. We put both of these products up and kept them for for at least a year, and I've really had good luck storing them both, and uh, I've never really had a had a bad experience with it. I guess we've used wet wet distillers and dry. We do like the wet distillers better; just it feeds better, makes us better ration. Other than that, I guess we'll pass it down. My name is Keith Gemmel. I'm from Fordville, North Dakota, and uh, I run a feedlot. We buy uh, background cattle, and we take them up to finish weight, and we've got different experiences with beet pulp, beet tailings, and we also store some wet distillers grain long term. I'm Kevin Elliott uh, from Clifford, North Dakota. We've got Sherbert Femmentals, uh, a bunch of sheep to run. Uh, my dad and my uncle run a feedlot at Galesburg and a bunch of commercial cows. We're about 30 miles from Castleton for the distillers and about 20 miles from Hillsborough for the beet. So it's a good location for byproduct feed. We utilize it the best we can. I'm Justin Spickler. I am in a partnership with my brother and we run a group of registered Angus cows and, and we've 
tried to incorporate uh, byproducts uh, as much as possible or or screenings products or something. I think the last time I bought uh, six or seven dollar corn was when it first started to go up. I had a bad experience with somebody where the corn price changed and I got to pay full price for corn after I thought I bought it for a couple dollars less. And we actually do finish some cattle and we develop a lot of, of our bulls and and the only actual grain product to go through them is, is whole oats. Um, as far as experience with byproducts, I always consult one of the extension people uh, before we try to store it, and, and that's been very beneficial. We did store some beet pulp where we piled it in the fall and covered it with plastic, and it had very, very little spoilage. Uh, ran into two problems that that uh, are now obvious after listening today. One of them, we couldn't get up on the pile like we thought we wanted to be able to. Our tractor would actually fall through at if the bucket was full, we didn't have a dozer. And the other problem was that we closed that pile of pulp up, and after it was covered, we closed it up because we wanted to save it for March when we were going through our thaw, and the pile actually froze on us, and so we didn't get to use it till April. But uh, it kept fine. It's just that we, by not keeping the pile open, it froze, and it, it presented a little bit of a challenge that way. But that's my most memorable experience uh, big solid block of beet pulp. I guess at this time, uh, if you guys have questions, I will open up for questions. I think Carl uh, has got a kickoff question for you guys, and we'll start with that. Okay, we have to repeat the question. Uh, so, uh, what is your best? Um, what have you found the best method of uh, feeding byproduct uh, or mixing to the cattle? And uh, we'll go down the line, or if someone has something they really want to share, uh, just jump in here. Put me on the spot for the first one. <laughs> uh, I guess our experience, uh, kind of like Dustin with the beet pulp, um, we put in quite a bit of beet pulp last fall. We made a deal with uh, Ottawapton, and we took uh, about 70, 80 loads of pulp during their pre-harvest where they couldn't get rid of it. And uh, we kind of made a verbal agreement with them at the time that if you take it now and you get a lot of spoilage, say January or February, that they would make it right with us. Well, we, I had a four-wheel drive with a blade on, so I could actually drive on the pile a little, and uh, <coughs> we pushed it up in a pile and I could drive on it. I did mix a little bit of straw with it, ground straw, just to kind of give it a little space, I guess, once in a while, because like Greg referred to, it started bulking out on the edges, and uh, we put uh, lined bales around the outside, and that really seemed to help soak up a lot of the moisture that over time that pulp kind of breaks down and uh, water seeps out of it. Um, and then delivering it to the cattle, uh, most of our cows are all fed in tires and we uh, CRM mix just about everything that's fed. Well, we use a TMR wagon for all of our feeding. and. Uh, we feed the beet pulp, we feed the distiller's grain, and as far as storing the beet pulp, what we've tried there is to mix it with uh, old chop straw or screenings, and that seems to really help. It'll it'll firm it up enough so that you can get up there and you can pack it with a with a tractor. As far as the uh, the distiller's grain, I'm kind of a greenhorn at storing that, but we did try something last fall where we got uh, 50 loads in and we just made a U with bales, lined that with plastic, uh, and and then uh, we put it up about four feet high on the bales and covered the pile with plastic and it seemed to uh, store real well. Matter of fact, we're just finishing up feeding that pile now that we stored last August. Okay, 
I guess uh, my only problem with it is when we're feeding with the TM in the TMR, you get some big chunks. You can really wreck a lot of machinery with those hard boulders that you put into the feed wagon. So you got to be careful. I think with you, know, like you said, when you mix it with some screenings or some pulp or some hay or something, it helps it. So when it's frozen, it's not quite as hard. It might break up a little bit instead of bending your augers and your feed wagon or your knives or whatever it is that you're feeding with. That's still really the only problems I've had with them. I guess I would uh, say I don't have too much to add other than ours all goes through a mixer wagon or distillers does and something that we've had to kind of train ourselves to be aware of is is to be to make sure the product is similar with each load, pretty much all of ours comes fresh. And if you get a load that's either real dry or real wet, it can really mess up a set of cattle if, if you're pretty close on your bunk calls. But uh, ours is always fresh, I guess. Question. Find it uh, uh, in the wagons. Does a, a reel work better than an auger wagon? Someone want to take? Well, I've got an auger wagon, so I'm kind of partial to that. But I have used a reel wagon, and it seems like the auger wagon mixes better for me. And I've also tried a vertical wagon, and uh, I think if you were on a high roughage ration, I think a vertical wagon would work fine. But on high concentrate ration, we didn't have very good luck with it. So myself, we use an auger wagon. How about these on second? We've had the same experience. I think we use both. We've got one couple auger wagons and one reel, and the reel mixes a lot quicker. The auger might mix better. I don't know. But I think they both work fine. We just have a reel, and if we didn't fill it so full, it would mix better. <laughs> Question. Carl. Fine. The question I have is, could each one of you tell your way that you preferred to put up a wet distillers or a wet uh, feed pulp into a pile? If you were to do it tomorrow, how would you do it? With your experience. <coughs> I want to start. <laughs> right now I'd pour a shitload of cement and get that underneath it so I can get to it, first of all. Uh, Otherwise, like with the wet distillers, you just had real good luck just piling it by itself and leaving it, not covering it. We just push it up the best you can with maybe bales around the edges. If we had a big cement bunker, that'd probably be better, but that takes a little cash too. And I guess I owe $5 in the swear jar too. Well, I think the... Uh Storing the wet distillers is a real issue, depending on its moisture. We got some at 35% moisture, and it was a bear to work with. You'd push it up, and when you turn around, it would come right back out at you. And we got some at 45%, and we could push it up about six feet high. But I think if I was to store wet distillers again, what I would try and do is to make a four-sided bunker out of straw bales, line it with plastic, and get a hold of some kind of a conveyor that you could back up to and just convey it in and just let it keep filling because it's kind of pointless to sit there and push it up with a loader when it comes right back out at you by the time the next truckload comes. So uh, I think that that would work, but I think with the distillers, you have to have a plastic cover on it. The experience that we've had is that we've had very little waste. Uh, I would say two to three inches is the most with a good plastic cover on there. I like your idea with the distillers. That's what we would do again. Um, we put it up both ways. We mixed it with uh, with straw, went through all the work of grinding straw, layering it in a manure spreader to try to get a, a mix, which was 
Yeah, it wasn't uh, science weighing it out, but it was a lot quicker than running through our feed wagon and running a lot of hours on our feed wagon. Um, so we ran it through the spreader. Then I could push it up in a pile and, and dry, actually drive on it and pack it. And it kept green. So we, we fed out of that pile for about a year and a half. And at the end, it was it was damn near as good as it was when we put it in there. So it was starting to show a little pile, a little spoilage. And we did cover it with plastic. Um, but it's time consuming. You know, when you get all them loads in, you got to have a place to put them loads. You got a place to put your ground hay and then other place for your pile. And three or four guys that could help. <laughs> And uh, if I would do it again, uh, the last time we did it, we put it in, made a bunker out of bales. And we didn't line the edges with plastic, but we did cover the top of it with plastic. And there, too, we had very little spoilage. And it's, it's just a lot less labor intensive. And as far as the beet pulp, uh, I guess we're planning on doing this fall the same thing we did last year. So we can get in on pre-harvest on beet pulp and mix just, a, just enough uh, ground hay with it to help drive on it, put it in a pile. And we did uh, that we just covered with some ground hay. We never put plastic on that. We had some freezing, but you could kind of peel that off and put it over in a pile, and once it starts on, then, then we fed that up to it with very little spoilage. We haven't had much trouble with beet pulp filling our real issue. But if you get if you come into frozen stuff, you can push it to the side, and then when the spring rolls around, you can just feed it up. But uh, like you say, as far as putting it into a mixed wagon, it's faster. To throw some yeah. chunks in there. They don't go through them. No. <laughs> they come back out the top. Yeah. If you covered your piles with uh, some ground hay or blew on some straw. Would that help with the freezing problem? We covered our beet pole pile here this last fall. That's what we did is blew on a bunch of straw on top of it. And we kind of got lucky, and the next day I got about an inch and a half of rain. Well, I don't know if you call it lucky or not. <laughs> we didn't need the rain, but it just sealed that straw right up. So, I think it really helped on my spoilage problem or issue, but I mean it still froze. We still had all you know, six, eight inches, and it was 25 below for a few days, and uh, and we were feeding out a pile every day, but it was still freezing on the edge. Yeah, we've had the same experience with uh, putting straw in the pile. It definitely helps with the freezing, and I don't think you get as much spoilage. Can you guys talk a little bit about the arrangement that you have with the plant that you're getting your products from, how often your delivery is, or how that you how you've got that set up? Our bee pulp delivery is real erratic. We try to do like Darren and get a get some in in the fall, so we've got a reserve, uh, and then we just get it as often as the truck driver can get it. Uh, which is a neighbor, which is really handy. Uh, as far as distillers, we get it. Uh, my brother works in uh, at Blue Flint, so we get. He makes us buy it from him, and uh, we get it out there, and it's always very available. I guess so. We don't have any trouble getting that. But the the pulp is, if, if you're intending to feed it for a certain number of days, you want to be a little ways ahead, so you make sure you have enough. Uh, I guess with the beet pulp, what we've done too is to stockpile it in the fall of the year so we don't have to fight for loads in the winter. And we also, own, especially if you're going to haul tailings, you run into freezing if you have to haul it very far. Uh, as far as the distiller's grain, we typically contract in June, or not June, but July or August for the coming year if they'll allow it. And what we, we get ours mainly out of Walhalla. Some of it comes out of Castleton. But what we find is that if we don't have a contract, when we need it, we can't get it, so we pretty much have to contract just to have availability. Yeah, that's kind of been our experience too with the with the pulp. Is kind of why we started 
laying a bunch of it in in the fall is, is especially with the feedlot ration, you come Friday afternoon and you're just about out of pulp and, and you're not going to get a load till Monday, and that's the quickest way to screw a bunch of cattle. And uh, so we kind of like to have it on hand. And with our distillers, we've been getting most everything out of calf with them. And since it's price that it is, we just been getting like a load a week during the winter when we were when we were using it up. And say if you can if you can get a contract as this you know as a nice way of doing it, but but uh, not all of them will contract with you. You got to walk all the way to the back of the room. I've got like four questions here. Uh, first one we've mentioned corn syrup. Just comments if any of you guys have had experience with the distiller soluble. Um, and then I'll give you another question while we're at it. Um, talked about Dalen's research with the spoiled feed. I uh, wonder if you guys take any precautions to manage your spoiled feed to certain groups of cattle. Uh, we've got some cow calf and feedlot operators there. So those are the two questions. Got those? On the solubles, we've used them back when we could get them a little easier. They're not when they're giving it away. It was a lot easier to get it than when you got to pay for it. <coughs> uh, but we, when we were grinding hay, we'd spray it up with the hay as it was coming out, and that was kind of our storage device. We didn't have any tanks or anything we just it wasn't uh, the science to it you were if you wanted to like for feedlot cattle if you want your ration really really consistent I probably wouldn't recommend that I recommend adding it and having I know there's a couple pamphlets in the books about storage tanks and I'd recommend that if you want to keep your ration consistent on the cow herd I wasn't quite as worried about it they get a little extra some days a little less some days the spring they were fat and fast easy. Um, what was the other question about that? Oh, the spoilage and the cow herd. And we try to take some moldy stuff away if we can a little bit in the feedlot. It means you don't worry about it too much. We've never fed any of the soluble. Uh, as far as spoilage goes, uh, our inclusion rate in the in the cow calf side of it, the cows were would be after calving typically is when we would use it. Uh, and in the feedlot ration, it, I guess we hadn't had any problems with it, and and we were pretty current, I guess, on our fresh distiller, so there wasn't a lot of spoilage. Well, we've never fed the syrup, so I don't really have any knowledge of that. But as far as the uh the spoilage on the other feed, we don't seem to have an awful lot of spoilage, but if if we get a chance, we scrape it off and try not to get it in the mix wagon. But we're strictly a feedlot, so we really don't worry about it too much with the abortion issue. I guess on the on the spoilage for us, um, there again with the distillers, we, we just don't seem to get a lot of a lot of spoilage. Um, and what we do, say we try to run through the feedlot end and especially during the winter and spring months when we're getting close to cabin, trying to keep that away from the cows. Um, what was the other question? And the oh, the solubles. Um, there too, we we don't feed a lot of solubles. Uh, about the only time we've used it, there too, we're too cheap. We only used it when it was free, and we just used it to cover our silage pile, and uh, and also put it over a beet pulp pile one year after we had it on just to kind of try to seal the pile up. But now that they're, you know, charging for it, and well, there's a grade that somebody alluded to that, you know, about 40, 50 percent of that is going to be lost of feed value what's in there from just drying out that we kind of went away from doing it. question was, is there any benefit of putting it on top of the pile? It, it kind of, yeah. 
it, it's hard to make that determination, I guess. Yeah, I think it helps them on the spoilage, but but uh, now we just cover everything with plastic, and, and we get a lot less spoilage. So as, as far as I'm concerned, the plastic is a better investment than, than the syrup was. When the syrup was free, then it, you know, it wasn't such an issue. Other questions? Any faster supplementation? No one supplemented out on the pasture with fly products. Yep. You want to expand? Uh, we feed uh, just to supplement our cows, keep them in good condition uh, through the winter months. Uh, a mixture of wet cake and potato waste. We discontinue doing that shortly before they calve and don't start doing it again until about 30 days after calving because they just produce so much milk that the calves can't handle it all. Anyone else that utilizes on the pasture? Other questions for our panel? What sort of information does the ethanol plant or the beet plant give you as far as the nutrient um, composition of the products? How often or what, what do they give you when you have a load go out? I guess our experience with that is, is when we've tried to get an analysis from uh, from Mindac with the bee pulp, it's been pretty much a generic one that they have gotten, uh, who knows when they wrote that one up. And so uh, what we did last fall when we put our pile in, I took uh, like a sample a day out of it, kind of mixed it all up and, and sent it in for an analysis, and that's what we based our our ration sheet off them, and uh, with the distillers too, I think they're a little more uh, a little more current with their analysis, um, especially with the sulfur issues and stuff. And and uh, we've sent some samples in, and, and it's always been real consistent. So we've kind of just been going by their analysis. Well, I guess the experience that we've had with the distiller's grain is that uh, in Walhalla, they test pretty much every load that comes out of there for moisture and for sulfur content, and that's the two things that we look at. And uh, on the stuff that we've had stored, what we've found over time is that the sulfur content goes up a little, and the, uh, the protein content goes up, and the moisture content goes down. They guarantee it at 65% moisture or less. And the sample we took after it had been stored for several months came back at 61. Yeah, we don't get much analysis from the plant. But the feed company that we use, the nutritionist and the guy that helps us out at the feedlot, he takes samples probably once a month on all of our ingredients that come into the feedlot just to look over everything. So. We'd be kind of the same way. We test the loads as we get them, and I guess at Blue Flint they do have stuff in place to kick off spec loads off to the side until they have a separate pile, and all I've learned from David is that you don't joke about off spec loads.
what's the highest percentage of ethanol byproducts in a dry matter basis you use, and have you seen any polio? I guess in our finishing ration, it'd be right at 30%. So we're using a modified product, uh, and we like it really well. We do use it real lightly in our bull ration, occasionally in our developing heifer ration, and then to um, as the cows are getting a little closer to peak lactation, we'll use a couple pounds in the spring. Uh, but the highest inclusion we have is in our uh, finishing diet at about 30%. And I guess what was the other half of it? Is there more to it than that? Uh, we actually had a case of polio this year that was misdiagnosed by management, and uh, we lost the animal. But it's been, uh, I guess I haven't seen one of those for about eight or nine years or maybe longer. Uh, so I did the math as Galen was talking about it, and our, our rate of incidence would be real similar to the one they saw, uh, obviously much smaller study. Yeah, I just usually work with a nutritionist in the extension service and ask them whatever they recommend. And then price has a lot to do with it too. You can feed an awful lot of things as extension says you can and get away with it if the price is cheap enough. Well, the highest inclusion rate that we've gone on uh, wet distillers grain right now, we're at about 40%. And uh, it's a little bit higher than the so-called experts recommend, but the nutritionist that we've got says you won't have any problem for that level, so that's where we are. I guess what we do is look at the price of wet distillers grain versus corn, and our wet distillers is by far the cheapest feed of the two. Yeah, we're, we're kind of the same way. Um, and I guess as far as on a finishing ration, um, we haven't finished many cattle in the last couple of years, but uh, we have fed up to 35% or 38% on a dry matter and got along well with that. Um, as far as the polio thing, we did we did have one uh, one calf about two years ago that uh, that's what he was diagnosed at anyway and and uh, we fed a lot of it to a lot of cattle and won over all the years and it's not really an issue. Other questions? Other questions? I guess the question for you guys, have, uh, we've talked a lot about corn distillers, beet products. Have you guys experimented with any other type of uh, co-products uh, that's been briefly talked about today? I've fed potatoes, cold potatoes, uh, and I've tried that many different ways, um, running them through a snowblower, trying to beat them up that way, feeding them whole, and uh, from my experience, I just don't think that they're worth it, so I don't do that anymore. <clears throat> oh, we get cheap soybean meal once in a while. It's cheap. Uh, soybean hulls. If they're priced right, everything usually comes down to price. We'll feed a lot of different things. Um, we got a edible bean plant in town. We'll get some splits once in a while, but we used to get a lot more. But they're it's ADM, and they got to run their regulations, and can't just take them anymore. They have to have a, 
I mean, what the heck is it called for pollution control? They have to know everything of where it went and who got it. But I guess we've used the we've used the gluten pellets and wheat mids, pea split, corn screenings, sunflower screenings, and we're kind of the same way. Economics comes into play, uh, and uh, as long as you know a little bit about each of those commodities, so you don't feed them feed them at too high a level, they all seem to work pretty good. You also need to know it's important to remember that, like for instance, our sunflower screens uh, are a little erratic in availability and can be very erratic in quality, so we don't want to, if we're getting those, we don't want to bank on them um, in a huge amount for energy in any ration. We just kind of consider it as a bonus. So if you keep some of that in mind, it sure seems to help, but uh, we're open to anything and everything, or we try to be. Um, I, uh, I don't, I guess I like to see people make money at six and seven dollar corn but I don't like to buy it at that and so we we try to use anything else that we can I'll just kind of go on with the screening thing there too we've, we've been using quite a bit of screenings the last couple of years and uh, we've noticed even from you know, one elevator to another, the difference in, in uh, quality or protein and feed value of them screenings varies a lot from, from uh, well, we were buying, we were kind of on the edge of the Red River Valley and buy some screenings west, or you buy some screenings out of Red River Valley, and it, it, there's a big difference in quality of feed that way. Um, and I guess I did feed one load of potatoes, but then probably five, six years ago, and, and I had the same experience. I, I couldn't deal with them, you know. You got all these lumps, and, and then once they froze in the wintertime, then you really had a problem with them. We tried to drive on them and everything else to flatten them out, and I wound up pushing them off to the side and waited till spring, and, and that was almost worse because they stunk so bad once they thought out that, that it was just a mess to get rid of them. But, um, I know they have a lot of good feed value, and, and there's some potato warehouses pretty close by to us, and the only reason I got them was because they were spoiling anyway, and they had to get them out of the house. So it wasn't a very good, fair analysis for potatoes, I guess. Any other questions? Well, let's thank our panel for coming in and Uh, sharing with uh, us some of their experiences with using some of these different products and how they utilize the stem in their operation. Uh, at this time, oh, Karina's telling me to hold up. I won't let you just mention that. Um, no, I don't want.